I remember the day it happened. Like it happened yesterday. On the evening of February 16th, 2010, I called for an ambulance. I was on my knees, tears in my eyes, my heart beating out of my chest, waiting for the ambulance. As I kneeled there, I fully expected to die. It was seven years ago, before my daughter was even a glimmer in my eye. I was working at a radio station, and I was also two years into my time at Dunkin' Donuts. I was younger then, thinner, with a few less gray hairs, and not quite 30 yet. I was just beginning my first semester at Central Connecticut. Literally, after the first day of class, I had a fight that night with my then girlfriend. That fight would end our relationship. This fight kicked off a three week stretch in which I was under constant stress and duress. I didn't have a place to live other than my friend's couch. And my car was pretty much a death trap. The mechanic who later fixed it pretty much said that I was lucky that it didn't break down on me long before he got to it. That shouldn't be too surprising because I have a long history of really pushing my luck. In the aftermath of my breakup, I wasn't managing the stress very well. In fact, I could be seen on campus muttering to myself, keep it together, keep it together. I was pretty convinced that I was going to end the semester by being carted off to the loony bin in a straitjacket. If anybody noticed, they were polite enough not to say so. At the end of that three weeks, I got my financial aid money to help bail me out of my various problems. I found a place to live in New Britain, in an old rooming house, and I found somebody who eventually fixed my car. But this was only the beginning of my problems. The night before I moved into the place in New Britain, I was talking to this girl on the phone that I'd actually met at a Star 99.9 event. For the first time in three weeks, I wasn't in survival mode, and I had a chance to reflect on what had happened to me up until that point. The walls fell. These self-protection mechanisms that had been standing for at least a decade of my life had completely gone away. I was defenseless. I was completely vulnerable and emotionally blubbering on the phone. I wrote a status about that on Facebook that sounded a little bit on the nutty side. The next night, I was in my new place in New Britain. I was talking to my, my then best friend on the phone, and I was seeing a world of possibilities. I had locked myself in a box for a long, long time, and now I was finally seeing beyond that box. After that phone conversation, I called the girl that I had talked to the previous night, and I was extremely happy. Happy doesn't even really begin to describe it. I was euphoric. I noticed during the course of that phone conversation that I was having trouble concentrating, but I thought it was just because I was excited. When I got off the phone, I was trying to do some homework, and I noticed I was still having a lot of trouble concentrating. I noticed that there was a stiffness in my chest and that my breathing was labored. When these symptoms didn't subside after a few minutes, I started to get a little bit nervous. I went onto the computer and went to WebMD. Not one of my more brilliant decisions, by the way. When I plugged in my symptoms, the first symptom that came up? Heart attack. At this point, I was pretty much completely freaking out and I instantly got out of my phone and started calling 911. I told the operator that I thought I was having a heart attack. They asked for my age and when I said 29, they were skeptical to put it mildly. Nevertheless, they sent an ambulance for me. 
I was on my knees, rubbing my chest, feeling it, my heart beating out of my chest, my breathing almost impossible. I really thought that I was experiencing my last moments and that I was going to die. As it turns out, in my panic, I actually sent them to the wrong address. I sent them one house ahead of where I actually was. The ambulance whizzed by my house, and when I, no I noticed this, I panicked even more. I quickly put on a pair of shoes and ran out of my house. I wasn't wearing socks, and I was only wearing a thin pair of shorts and t-shirt in the dead of winter while it was actually snowing outside. I shouted for the ambulance people that were just ahead of me that I was the one that actually needed the help and I looked for all the world like a complete crazy person. After convincing them that I was the one they were looking for, I couldn't even give them my name. I was so whacked out at this point that I couldn't spell my name nor could I speak it. They eventually had to resort to going into my house to find my wallet to figure out who the heck I even was. I kept asking if I was having a heart attack and if I was going to die over and over. This was how I was introduced to the neighborhood, by being carted off in an ambulance. I'll spare you the suspense. I didn't die that day. I'm a man of many talents, but communicating from the afterlife is not one of them. Nor was I having a heart attack. What I was having that night was a panic attack. So what is a panic attack? The Mayo Clinic actually has a pretty good definition. A panic attack is a sudden episode of intense fear that triggers severe physical reaction when there is no real danger or apparent cause. Panic attacks can be very frightening. When panic attacks occur, you might think you're losing control, having a heart attack, or even dying. A person who experiences anxiety and panic attacks can react the same way to losing their wallet as an average person would react to being chased by a bear. It's your body telling you that you are going to die or that your life is in danger in a situation that doesn't even come close to warranting that reaction. There are many actual causes for panic attacks. Many mental illnesses such as bipolar disorder, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, all have panic attacks as a symptom, and many more include anxiety as a symptom. In addition to that, there's also possible physical causes for panic attacks, such as a thyroid condition. This is one of the reasons why, if you're having panic attacks, it's going to be very difficult to diagnose exactly why, because there are so many possible reasons for it. If you go to the doctor, they're likely not going to spend too much energy trying to figure it out. They will, more than likely, just give you medication, such as the benzos and the antidepressants that I mentioned in my mental stigma video. I talked at length in my mental stigma video exactly why that's such a problem. My advice to people who are experiencing these issues is to take control of your treatment. But that's certainly easy for me to say. Someone who is experiencing these issues is not in any way thinking rationally because they are scared out of their minds and they will do whatever the doctors tell them to do to make it stop. In my specific case, the reason I was having panic attacks is because I have anxiety problems and I've had them for my entire life. But up until this time, I didn't truly understand that. I just thought I was a really nervous person. I had always known about my depression issues, but not about my anxiety. And I myself was one of the many who didn't really understand what anxiety was. Panic attacks were never really a part of my anxiety problems. Not until this era of my life. My theory behind that was that the stress and stress that I was under caused my body to go completely out of whack. During this time, I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs without almost having a panic attack. My body couldn't tell the difference between my heart increasing because of exercise 
or because I was in a situation in which I was going to die. I was told in the hospital that I had a panic attack, and they gave me a prescription for a little razepam. They gave me enough of a supply until I could find my regular doctor. And of course, one of the first things I did was look up the symptoms for panic attack on WebMD. I'm pretty sure by doing this, I prolonged my problems. Searching for a doctor that took my insurance from my school was an adventure in itself. Weeks went by before I found anyone, and I wasn't going to be able to get an appointment for months. In the meantime, my supply of lorazepam, the only thing that was keeping me out of the hospital, was dwindling. Or at least that's how I saw it at the time. Words cannot really even begin to describe how scary this time of my life really was. My mind and body had turned pretty thoroughly against me. There was always part of my brain that was diseased in its thinking, but now that disease was in overdrive. Walk up a flight of stairs, panic attack. Help my grandparents move. I need to take a little razepam to avoid an attack. Play a video game and not do very well, and that was enough to set off panic attack symptoms. There were definitely times quite a few actually, where I considered the possibility that I was going to end up hospitalized. It was several weeks before I realized, hey, the college that I'm going to actually has medical services on campus. So I went there and told my tale of woe, hoping that I might be prescribed the lorazepam that I thought I needed. I pretty much told her that if I didn't get the medication that I thought I needed, that I was going to end up in the hospital again. She kicked me up to the counseling services uh, under the impression that my situation was an emergency one. After once again describing my situation to the counselor, the counselor wasn't convinced that this was actually an emergency situation. I had an appointment with them next week, and she figured that anything further could wait till then. She told me that they were not comfortable prescribing me the lorazepam. That alone was good enough to start setting off panic attack symptoms. She managed to calm me down and she told me that I would be okay. And at that moment in time, that brief moment in time, I believed her. She told me I already had a game plan. That if I started having really bad problems, that I could just go to the hospital. Missing, of course, that that, that was a situation I was hoping to avoid. I wasn't even fine for full 24 hours. The next morning, the mechanic that was supposed to fix my car was MIA. And as a result, I suddenly started having severe panic attack symptoms. I had exactly one little razepam left, and I took it. I then went in search for a walk-in clinic that would hopefully take my insurance. As well as one that might take me on short notice without an appointment. It took me a few tries, but I eventually found a place. The doctor listened to my story for a while and prescribed me the lorazepam as I asked him and another medication which he told me would take two weeks to work. I had absolutely no idea what he was prescribing me. I have previously discussed my stances and attitudes towards medications. So the fact that I was willing to take something without even knowing what it was should give you a hint as to what my state of mind was at the time. I took one of the anxiety medications and one of the medication that I had no clue to what it was before going to work. Even though I didn't quite know what I was taking, I did read the side effects. On my way to work, driving on the highway, I suddenly felt very nauseous. I tried to hold it back, but I couldn't. I grabbed a bag that was in my car and started basically puking into it while driving. I somehow managed to get to work without incident or without crashing my car. On the deck outside of the Marlboro Dunkin' Donuts, I basically laid on the ground and was dry heaving before going into work. I made my, up my mind right then and there that I really could not stay there. 
I went inside and went directly to the assistant manager. I started blubbering and rambling and telling her everything that had been happening in the last couple of months and how I was feeling at that moment, which was nauseous and really, really confused. I told her that I really couldn't be there. I agreed to stay there until my coworker got there, but I was so confused and I didn't have any clue what was going on. I left before she got there. The next morning, my boss called me to yell at me, and I had no choice but to pretty much tell him what my problems were. And I actually told him what medication I was taking, and he identified it as an antidepressant, because someone he knew had been on it. And that was the rather embarrassing way that my place of work found out about my issues. The ones that I had been pretty much trying to keep under wraps at the time. As far as the radio station I was working at, I really had no choice, I thought, other than to ask for a leave of absence. There was no way I was going to handle going to school, working as much as I was at Dunkin' Donuts, and handling my mental health problems which were threatening to consume me whole. This would effectively end my nearly four years of working there. When I was looking to return, they basically told me that they didn't really have any slots open. I was really only planning on going back for the summer anyway. That's a bit of a long story in itself. We've talked quite a bit about anxiety, but we have yet to actually define it. Anxiety is defined as a nervous disorder characterized by a state of excessive uneasiness and apprehension, typically with a compulsive behavior or panic attacks. I read an article a couple years ago that painted a pretty good picture of what living with anxiety is actually like. Let's say you lock your keys in your car. That's a pretty stressful situation for anybody. Maybe you're going to be late for work, an appointment, a date, or maybe you can't get back inside your house. For the average person, this would be a pretty aggravating situation. A person who suffers from anxiety is going to have a very different reaction than the average person. It'll start with worrying about the typical things such as being late to work or missing an appointment. And it will snowball from there into something entirely different. A person with this condition might start thinking, hey, what if somebody calls me needing me to take them to the hospital? What if they're seriously hurt and the only way to get there is through me and I can't go because my keys are locked in my car. So it's quite possible with my keys locked in my car, my friend is going to die. And then panic attacks and anxiety symptoms go through the roof. The average person who hears this line of thinking is going to go, what? How did your mind get there? It is definitely a messed up line of thinking and it is completely irrational and sooner or later the person who suffers and has this thinking process will realize that themselves we know that we are sometimes irrational it's not it's not something we can entirely control it's the disease part of our mind in certain situations like that there's always a part of my mind that's telling me that i'm completely crazy and that i shouldn't be thinking that way and basically my mind is at war with itself at that moment There are many different types of anxiety disorders. Let's go through a few of them so we can get a better understanding. The first one I would like to talk about is social anxiety disorder. According to the Social Anxiety Association, ang social anxiety is a fear of social situations. It's basically anxiety of being negatively judged or evaluated by people in social situations. It is a pervasive disorder that causes anxiety and fear in all areas of one's life. People with this disorder are sometimes seen as aloof or unfriendly. At the same time, people who suffer from this particular condition want to make friends and want to be social, but the fear holds them back. The sufferers generally know that their feelings and thoughts are irrational, but they can't quite help themselves. It is essentially a chronic condition. 
typical methods for treating anxiety, such as medications, are not going to help one who suffers from social anxiety. It's not going to stop one who suffers from self-medicating using drugs or alcohol, which is a pretty bad way to go. The good news is that it is a pretty treatable condition. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a pretty effective treatment for those who suffer from social anxiety. Known as CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy is basically changing the way one thinks in a situation that will cause them anxiety. CBT has been known to try to treat all anxiety conditions and disorders and some other mental illnesses such as PTSD. Its effectiveness varies from person to person. At any given time, about 7% of the population will suffer from a social anxiety, and about 13% of the population will develop some kind of social anxiety within their lifetimes. Moving on to panic disorder, which according to HealthyPlace.com is characterized by multiple panic attacks and the fear surrounding these attacks. The fear of having more panic attacks actually leads to more panic attacks. Panic disorder is only diagnosed after multiple panic attacks that continue for more than one month. Panic disorder often occurs in people who have previously experienced low levels of anxiety. Normally this occurs between the ages of 18 to 45. From this description, it sounds Pretty much what was happening to me back in 2010 was me developing a panic disorder. Treatment for this condition includes the benzos and the antidepressants that I've already discussed as well as CBT. I'll discuss a little bit later exactly how this particular disorder relates to me or doesn't. The last condition I will discuss before moving on is generalized anxiety disorder otherwise known as GAD. According to healthplace.com, GAD is defined as anxiety and worry that is excessive, unrealistic, and often feels out of control. To be clear, it is normal for people to worry, especially when life is stressful. However, according to healthplace.com, when excessive worry anxiety and physical symptoms like heart palpitations start to negatively impact the day-to-day -day functioning, this can be a sign of GAD. Generalized anxiety sufferers are basically constant worry warts. The scenario I used about locking one's keys in the car and how a person who suffers from anxiety will react to that situation fits GAD to a T. And it also is a pretty thorough description of myself. I certainly have elements of social anxiety, and at one point I definitely had panic disorder, but what fits my symptoms the most is generalized anxiety disorder. This condition is known to negatively impact people's lives just as much as severe mental illnesses such as major depressive disorder. Treatment for this condition includes the medications that I've already discussed, as well as talk therapy and CBT. In addition to that, lifestyle changes can also help with the symptoms of this particular condition. Changes to one's diet, uh, exercising more, better quality sleep, and avoiding alcohol and drugs can all help with the symptoms. After the incident that led to Dunkin Donuts learning of my problems, I refused to take another antidepressant. However, I kept taking the lorazepam. During this period of time, talking to me was a pretty big headache. At times, I talked like the micro machine man. The lorazepam actually had the impact of lowering my inhibitions, so I had no problem oversharing. I at one point was loudly talking about my mental health problems at a Barnes & Noble with my friends. My then best friend, a person whose major was actually psychology, was urging me to get off the medications. And in fact, I wanted to get off the medications because I hated them. I hated them, but I thought I needed them. 
I thought it was the only way to keep me from having panic attacks. If I didn't have them on me, I had major anxiety over it. I had a couple of counseling sessions at the school. During the second session, the counselor suggested that I take part in an anxiety drug trial. One of the requirements of this trial was they wanted me to normalize my medication. Either they wanted me on a, on a regular basis or off it entirely. I was basically taking it as a per needed basis. Whenever I felt panic attack symptoms, I took a medication. I was not taking it regularly. I didn't really want to go on the med medication on a regular basis. I wanted to get off it. In fact, at this point I was even trying. But I didn't think I was there yet. I didn't think I had the coping mechanisms I needed to get off the medication entirely. The counselor, however, wanted me to get off the medication. In fact, was urging me to do so, like my best friend was. At this point, she didn't think any more counseling sessions were going to help me, and just wanted me to, uh, to go into the trial. When she told me this, I freaked out. From my perspective, she wanted me to get off the medication that I was dependent on without giving me any guidance or helping me to develop coping mechanisms. I really thought that she was hanging me out to dry. She told me that school was soon to end and that she didn't really have enough time to help me. And she genuinely thought that the drug trial was the best route for me to go. A couple days later, I had the appointment with the doctor that I had scheduled months ago. I told her all that had happened to me. And I told her what the counselor recommended with the drug trial. The doctor was not thrilled. She straight up didn't want me to do it. She ordered blood tests to rule out a thyroid problem and scheduled me for a psych evaluation to figure out exactly what was going on with me. I told her I was dead set against any kind of antidepressants, that I really didn't want to take them. This is when she gave me the crucial piece of advice that has always stuck with me. She told me it was my body, it was my choice. I didn't have to put anything in my body that I didn't want to. So if I didn't want to take antidepressants, I didn't need to take antidepressants no matter what they said. From there, I fought to get off the Lorazepam. I wanted to prove that I could be okay without taking anything at all. That I didn't need to be on antidepressants. Not just to them, but to myself. I started going as long as I could without taking a medication. Days would go by before I would take one, and usually it would be because my stomach was hurting. This could have been withdrawal, but it also could have been my stomach tightened from anxiety, which was masked by the medication. I remember one specific day where it seemed like I was going to have a panic attack all day long. Each time I would take out that bottle, that bottle I hated with a passion, and I would go to take a lorazepam, and I stopped myself every time. I finally texted my friend and asked him if I could come over for dinner. He told me sure, but I was going to have to buy. And I was okay with that. So I went and bought spaghetti, a ridiculous amount actually. The whole time in the grocery store, I felt like I was on the verge of a panic attack and I was trying to keep myself calm. I still refrained from taking a medication. When I got to my friend's house, I told him I was struggling and I thanked him for helping me. He told me that it was actually I that helped myself. I was the one that reached out, and I was the one that came over instead of taking a medication. I wasn't sure that I could keep it up. I couldn't always count on going over my best friend's house or another friend's house. They might not always be available. So what was I going to do? He recommended that I actually go to a bar located near the school. The place was called Elmer's and it's where most of the Central Connecticut students actually went to relax and unwind. It's actually the bar that I talked about in my Mental Stigma video where I encountered the loudmouth who decried any and all therapy as weakness. I never took another lorazepam and panic attacks became a thing of the past. Sure, there are times when I get close. But full-on panic attacks for me are rare. This was not the end of my story. 
this is the end of this particular story. But my problems are ongoing. Recovery is not always steps forward. In fact, sometimes it steps backwards. And I took some giant step backwards to lead to my current life circumstances. It was during this time that I did some really amazing things. Things that you wouldn't necessarily think that I would do. For instance, I went to the Portland Quarries with my then best friend and other friends. At the quarries, they had cliff jumping. I had observed other people attempting to do it, and they would stand there forever, working up the courage to actually jump. The trick, I realized, was not to think about it, just to do it. If you take the time to think about it, if you give yourself any moment to think about it, you will hesitate, and then you will just end up standing there forever. Don't think, just jump. For a while, I did some pretty amazing things operating off of that philosophy, at least amazing for me. Before I conclude this video, I should talk about the one thing that I haven't really much yet, and that is depression. I don't have some big story to illustrate my depression issues. They've been a lifelong problem. They've impacted my relationships with my family, my friends, and even at times my daughter. It's been a mild enough problem over the years that I consider myself to be high functioning. I go to work. I do what I absolutely need to do, even at my worst. Anything that isn't absolutely necessary though, in my worst times, I won't do. Such as maybe going out to see a friend or being social in general. Part of that is just my introverted nature, but the rest of it is due to my depression when it's acting up. According to the Mayo Clinic, depression is a mental health disorder characterized by persistently depressed mood or loss of interest in activities causing significant impairment in daily life. Depression and anxiety pretty much walk hand in hand. Anxiety is in fact a symptom of depression. Where one condition exists, likely so too does the other. The condition affects everybody. All age groups. It's mainly treated with therapy and medication, such as antidepressants. Unfortunately, as I covered at length, antidepressants are a mixed bag. I talked about this in my mental stigma video, but the antidepressants can make you worse. It can push you into a suicidal ideology that could result in you killing yourself. As the doctor told me, it could take up to two weeks to work and it might not help at all. Finding the right antidepressants can take a long time and can be a, a long battle to get better. As I covered in my stigma video, it really is not worth it for me to go on medications to treat my depression issues. I'd rather do therapy. There is just too much risk associated with my depression being made worse and I'm not willing to take that chance. Some days are better than others. Some weeks are better than others. Some months are better than others. My story isn't over. My problems haven't ended. It's still a battle every day. I will never get to a point where I can say I've conquered either my depression or anxiety. When it comes down to it, that's true of anybody. You can never get to a point and declare yourself good. You have to keep moving. You have to keep trying to improve as a person. Mental illness or not, we are all on our own journeys. Our own struggles, our own crosses to bear. If you are a person who suffers from the issues I've described, I hope you see yourself in it. I hope you see that you are not alone. If you don't suffer, I hope I've given you some insight into what many people experience. Now ask me, do I regret my experiences? Do I regret my struggles? I regret things I've done. I regret chances I haven't taken. I regret people that I've lost in my life as a result of my problems. I do not for one second regret my experiences. They are what make me and my story unique. It is because of who I am 
because of my high level of empathy and the talents that I have, that I can make something positive out of everything that I've experienced. I can speak for those who can't speak for themselves, either because they are afraid to, or because they just don't have the ability. I can help spread awareness of these issues of anxiety and depression and other mental illnesses. I can give a voice to the millions of people that suffer from these conditions. And that is a power I fully intend to use.